Well, this morning, um, we're going to continue our, our series through John's Gospel that we just started, really. We had our, our first message in John's Gospel a couple weeks ago where we introduced it and we talked about what John's Gospel is all about. In fact, John himself states the purpose of his Gospel um, towards the end of it in chapter 20 where he says this, but these are written, these events that I'm sharing about Jesus, the teaching and events about Jesus are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So again, we've kind of called John a, an um, evangelistic apologetic, I guess, where he's, he's presenting Jesus Christ, but not just presenting Jesus Christ and who he is, but he's presenting Jesus Christ and who he is so that we can believe in him and find life in him, real life in him. And um, so like the other Gospels, and there's four Gospels, and like the other Gospels, um, John also presents Jesus. But John is a little unique from the other three Gospels in that the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, present Jesus, but a lot of their focus is on what Jesus did and the works of Jesus, which John does focus and and. And touch upon some of those things. But John, rather than presenting who, what Jesus did, rather John more heavily focuses on who Jesus is. And this is important because um, who Jesus is, if, if we believe and, and we trust who Jesus is, it truly does change our lives. So, um, and, and because John kind of takes this different focus of Jesus and it's more of a... a existential look at Jesus or the spiritual look at Jesus, it's, it's both simple but also complex at the same time um, as Jesus is seen as God in the flesh. And we're going to talk about what that means a little bit next week, but we're going to kind of dive in this morning into chapter one. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to John's gospel. It's in the New Testament, fourth book of the New Testament, John's gospel, chapter one. And as I kind of read these, uh, these verses um, over the past couple of weeks, I, I kept thinking of, of, of in the 1980s. You remember Mike Tyson? Mike Tyson, man, he was the boxer, heavyweight boxer in the, in the 80s. And he was terrifying, right? I mean, he would just destroy guys, and he's undefeated all through the 80s and everything. And, and, and he came up to one fight where he was fighting this guy, Michael Spinks, who was a classic boxer, and he was also undefeated. And everybody says, ah, this is where Tyson's finally going to, you know, he's undisciplined, and he's going to finally fight a real fighter, and, you know, he's going to get it handed to him, and all of this, and he's going to lose, and it's going to be amazing. And so they kept talking about this fight with Michael Spinks and how he's finally going to meet his match, and it's, it's, everybody's expecting it to go the distance. And when fight night came... The, the fight opens, and the bell rings in the first round, and Mike Tyson pretty much just runs over to Michael Spinks and just starts throwing punches. You know, a lot of times they kind of feel each other out and kind of jab each other. Mike Tyson just starts throwing haymakers right from the opening bell. One minute and 13 seconds later, Michael Spinks is knocked out laying on the mat. And this fight that everybody says, ah, it's going to be close was over before it began because Mike Tyson came out throwing haymakers. And, and this is kind of the, the picture I got as I kind of read through what, what our passage is this morning, that as John's gospel opens, John opens his gospel throwing haymakers. He comes out swinging big, basically um, making some huge statements about who Jesus is that just kind of knock us right in the face and just like, whoa, wow. So it's, it's a little shocking, some of the things that John says, but it's going to take a little bit to unpack it. But let me read to you um, what we're going to look at this morning from John chapter 1, and we can kind of see some of these haymakers. So John chapter 1, verse 1, it starts, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And we're going to stop right there because we could probably spend a month uh, kind of going through. It's, it's kind of a lot to take in, isn't it? When we kind of read that. And we don't even read Jesus' name in here yet. And um, although we're going to dive in and, and kind of uh, get an idea of what John is saying here, we're not going to be able to exhaust what John is saying to completely understand everything he's saying this morning. But don't worry about that because what this really is, and a lot of people call this John's prologue, you know, the opening of the book. And in a sense, um, you know, I always kind of make fun of John calling him a hippie because he's taking this kind of, you know, existential look at Jesus. But um, this is kind of like if you're in college and you're writing a formal paper, this is kind of like your thesis statement is what John is doing. So he's laying out and saying, this is what... I am going to prove in what I'm about to write. So he lays out, it's basically a summary of what he's going to dive into the rest of his gospel, the rest of the book of John. He's going to give all of the proofs of why of what he's saying is true. So the rest of John is about this. So that's why, although we might not fully understand it, we need to understand and at least grasp what he's saying here Because once we do start to grasp what he's saying, then we're going to see the rest of the gospel through this lens and see how he proves all of this. So John's kind of laying all of this out for us so we can get the rest of the gospel. So this is why this is important, this kind of introduction or this this, uh, prologue as it's called. So let's just dive in, okay? (laughs) And we're going to kind of start to really look at what he's saying and why he's saying what he's saying and what he's saying by the words he's using. So he begins, right? In the beginning was the Word. And you'll notice here, Word is capitalized. What is that talking about? What is this Word? You know, and that kind of stands out. John here isn't just referring to a Word. Okay, he isn't saying in the beginning was a Word. He says in the beginning was the Word. So it's not just a simple Word, but he's referring to a person. Here the Word is means Jesus. And we know that by reading the rest of John and to see where he's going at it, but also in what he's saying at that Jesus is the Word. So when we see this through this passage, we know that he's speaking of Jesus and saying the Word. Why why doesn't he just say Jesus? In the beginning was Jesus. Well, the idea of the Word actually goes into the culture he's writing into because in the Greek culture, remember philosophy and all of this, um, Word, the word was very important concept because the word was where all things originated, where wisdom originated, right? It was there where things came into being. When the word was spoken, things came into being. Or when it was written, that was when it was shared. So it was when meaning was imparted and it was through the word, okay? So, um, In a sense, it was the action that started everything, was this idea of the word. Now, in this case, John isn't referring to a thing like a word or wisdom or even an idea. Rather, here John is um, referring to a person, Jesus. So, when we think about what he's saying through by saying the word, what does he really mean by this? Um, R.C. Sproul, who's a famous theologian, he, he, he notes that what kind of the word refers to is the eternal divine actor or bringing things into action is the way he kind of refers to it. Um, or Jesus is the originator. Or like I like to look at this, the word means the source. This is where things begin or come into being is through Jesus. So he is the originator or he is the source. 
Um, so, so we kind of have this idea, right? Because Jesus didn't come into being when he was just born as a, as, a, as a baby, right? He was in the beginning. So before anything was, he was. So this is what John is talking about, that, that, that he is eternal. Jesus was there before anything else. He is eternal. And everything came from him. So he's the source of all things, just as the word was kind of the source of wisdom or the beginning of wisdom in, in, in the Greek culture. Here he's saying Jesus is this for us. So it's not just this word, it's a person. And then he goes on to say, well, this word or Jesus was with God and was God. And again, another huge statement here. And what John is presenting here is something that's so foundational to our faith. It's, it's the idea of the Trinity. Have you heard the term the Trinity? Now, the Bible never uses the term the Trinity, but the Bible teaches it throughout, that this idea of the Trinity, okay? But, but um, basically what, what he's talking about is this Jesus, or the Word, is God because He's saying this word is eternal. In the beginning, Jesus already was, so he's eternal. He's before time began because in the beginning means when everything was created. Well, before things were created, there was no time. Time is a creation, right? That's when things started. And before things started, Jesus was, which God is the only one who's eternal. So he's saying Jesus is eternal, therefore Jesus is God. And he also is, is because the word is also God, because Jesus states that he is God. And Jesus states it in John's gospel. He says, I and the Father are one. You know, if, if, you, have, if you have seen me, you have seen God. So Jesus kind of, kind of shares this and is basically, so through this evidence, yeah, Jesus, this word is God. But then John says, but he's also with God. Well, if he is God, then how can he be with God? And what John's talking about is there's a distinction within God that is also God. There's a distinction there. And, and what he's talking about there is the Trinity, that even though Jesus is God, he's also with God. And this idea of the Trinity is a huge concept that I don't think we can fully grasp in this service, but I, I want to read to you um, theologian John, uh, Wayne Grudem wrote a systematic theology, and here's basically his definition of the Trinity, just so we can kind of get the idea. He, here's what he says. There is one God in three persons, three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God, yet there is only one God. Okay, so there's one God, but there's three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Each of these persons is fully God. They're not just a part of God. Each person is fully God. The Father is fully God. The Son is fully God. The Holy Spirit is, is fully God, yet there is one God. It's inseparable. So what is that talking about? How can there be these three different gods? It's not the three different gods. There's three different persons. Um, or these persons, they're more like functions of the one God or roles of God. So the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God, the Holy Spirit is fully God. Each of these persons has a distinct role in the way they function with each other and with creation. And Scripture kind of talks about this, but basically, here's kind of the role of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, this, this triune God. The Father is kind of like the planner. The Father gives purpose to things. The Father gives plans to things, kind of the director. The Son then accomplishes these purposes. The actor, as R.C. Sproul says, right, the eternal divine actor, that he accomplishes these things. Then the Holy Spirit then provides the power and the presence to sustain all that the Father has planned and all that the Son has accomplished. You got it? It's, it's a lot, isn't it? So um, Jesus is equal to God, yet distinct from the Father and the Spirit. 
okay? Um, but these three, they're preexistent, they're distinct, and they're inseparable and fully God. And this is what he's saying in this word was God and it was with God. This is what he's getting at here. And uh, again, we could swim in this pool and never explore it all, but in a nutshell, that's the Trinity. And, and throughout God, John's gospel even, he, he has Jesus develop this idea of the Trinity, um, you know, where Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God, but then he says, I and the Father are one. And then he says, if you've seen me, you've seen God. And then he talks about, I go to prepare a place for you, but I'm sending a helper, the Spirit, who will be with you to encourage you. So he, he talks about these persons of the Trinity it, it th throughout and kind of makes this and builds this. So we'll be, we'll be seeing how that all works through the rest of John. And again, this is kind of that thesis statement that he says he's going to prove how Jesus is God and is with God and all of these things. And, and, but, but basically, John shares this point um, to, to make this point that Jesus is fully God. This word is fully God which is foundational, again, to our faith. Why? Because if Jesus is not God and is not fully God, then when he dies for sins, basically he's dying for his own sins because he's just a person dying for his own sins. Therefore, we have no Savior. If he's no God, if he's not fully God, then what he has to say, they're kind of merely suggestions, right? We can pick and choose what we want to follow, follow. Um, rather than what he says, giving life itself. However, if Jesus is truly God, then we must deal with him. And that's why it's important, why John sets it forth right at the beginning, because this Jesus, if he's truly God, then what he does and what he says and who he says he is matters. And that's why it's important. In fact, almost every major heresy and cult that comes along distorts this right here. It distorts the reality of Jesus being fully God and fully man. Some, some heresies make um, Jesus a God, and they translate this that Jesus was with God and he was a God. So if he's just merely a God, does that make him less than the one true God? You know, and, and what about the one true God? And what about when he says, I and the Father are one? And, I, you know, you've seen God, you've seen the Father? It doesn't work. And somehow that makes him less than God, right? Um, some, some kind of look at Jesus and say, well, he's created or he's born of God. So God created him. So again, he's lesser than God. Well, then if he's lesser than God, why do I listen to him and not... Just God, and so why does he command what I ascend or have any authority over me? Um, some say that Jesus is just a man who became God because of his good works. And over the years they did that, and they want to focus on just what Jesus did. And that's how he became God, and thus, if we can just be good enough, we can become little gods as well. I've ever seen that in some of these heresies. And, and others still try to just diminish Jesus to merely just a good man or a teacher. And they say, well, Jesus is a good man to follow, just like Gandhi or somebody like that. So yeah, he's got some things of value. But you see, if, he's not, if, if I can diminish him enough to just say, well, yeah, I like Jesus and I like what he has to say, and he's one of the good teachers, then I can pick and choose what I want to follow and what he says that I give credence to. And therefore, I really don't have to change my life because of him, and I can pick and choose. In fact, that was one of the big things that happened during the, during the Jesus movement back in the 70s where people were looking at all these different religions and picking and choosing what they want. And it's when some of these people just said, no, we can't do this with, with Jesus because he's the only God. He's the one true God. Therefore, we have to deal with him. And that's how the Jesus movement exploded but it started because people were trying to pick and choose from all these different religions what they wanted to believe. And they realized, with well, Jesus, we can't do that. Why? Because if he truly is who he says he is and what he says is true, then it has to change my life in some sense. And that's why people in our world try to diminish who Jesus is or try to diminish what the Bible is about. Because if we can kind of take that apart and said, this truly isn't God's word, then we can pick and choose and we can say, well, it's up to how we want to interpret it. But it's not. 
And Jesus is not just some man. He is God, fully God. And that's what John is saying here. So it's important. And this is what, what John presents in the rest of his gospel, remember? So that, we, so that we have to deal with him, so that we may believe and find life in his name. So this is the beginning of our understanding of Jesus, that, that he is God, he has always existed, and was there before anything else came to being. And we have to kind of grasp this, these first two verses kind of. In short, you know, Jesus, the word, he's the source. So if we understand what, what John is kind of saying here is basically Jesus is the source of all good things. You know, all good things come from him. In fact, this is what John gets at at the rest of this, this passage, this prologue of what he's saying is Jesus is the source of all these things. And then he shares what Jesus is the source of and why it matters. In fact, Jesus is the source, and as the source of all things, we not only come from him, but we can also then come to him if he's the source, right? We know where we come from, but then we can go back to the source because that's where we're going to find truth. That's where we're going to find what matters. It's like plugging into an outlet. That Jesus is our source for this so that we can also come to him. For without Jesus, life is meaningless and we are lost. So John presents Jesus and says, this Jesus is the source. So what is Jesus the source of? More specifically, um, basically, why does it matter to us? Well, here's what John then goes on to share in the rest of the passage as we read, and starting in verse 6. Basically, he continues, and, and we discover that this Jesus, the word, right, is, is first of all the source of existence. Jesus is the source of existence. Look at verse 3. It says, all things were made through him, and without him not anything was made that was made. You get that? Nothing existed unless Jesus brought it into existence. Everything that exists, everything that has been made or created has been made by him. All of creation, light, the sun, the earth, plants, animals, humans, all of it was made by Jesus. It came about by the word of God. He was the actor, right? What does it say back in Genesis? And God spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light. He said, he spoke the word. Jesus, the actor. So when he spoke, that's Jesus, the actor, going in. Let there be light. Okay? This is brought into creation. Paul kind of expands on this in Colossians. He says this about Jesus. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him. And he takes it a step further. And for him. For him to have, for him to be the source of, to be the owner of, in a sense. And not, so not only was it made through him, but for him. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later in, in the message here, and a little bit later in John, we'll kind of flesh that out. And, and if you look at that and you say, all right, so if everything that came about was because of Jesus, then, let's see, sin exists, so then Jesus, sin exists because Jesus made it exist? then that makes Jesus evil. And some people point to that and say, see, this is why God isn't good, because sin exists, and if God made all things, then he made sin. No. Okay, Jesus brought everything good into existence. He created it all. Sin was not created. Okay, real quick, I'm going to give you a, a little statement on sin, and we're just going to kind of leave it there and... Not go much further. Here's what sin is. Sin is not something that's created. Sin is a distortion. It's a perversion of something. It's a perversion of all that God has created that is good. And sin basically distorts that. It's mankind distorting that for our own. You look at everything that God created. God created everything and it was perfect, right? It was good. Look at the tree in the garden. There was nothing wrong with the tree in the garden. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was good. It was perfect. Yet... 
How did that become sin? It became sin when, when mankind tried to pervert it so that they could be like God. See, that was the sin. God didn't create that. God created the tree. Man took it and distorted what was good to make it their own instead of God, thus rejecting God. So sin is this rejection of God that basically distorts everything that he has made. So that's why God can't be blamed for sin. Because he created it and it was good, man perverted or distorted it. That's how the world was created. It was perfect, and then sin enters the world, right? And everything falls apart. And that's kind of that idea of sin. So, so to, to, to under, kind of understand that. So everything good has been created by the word, right? And then it goes on in the next verse. Verse 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Not only did creation come through Jesus, but he is also the giver of life. So God just didn't create static things like a rock, but he actually gave life to creation, brought creation to life. And more importantly, right, human beings. Again, God spoke into creation, and in the creation of man when he spoke, Jesus was the word, the divine actor, or he was the source of that life. And he's also the source of spiritual life, as we're going to see in a couple points down here, a couple verses down in what, what um, John is talking about. And that's kind of what's behind this idea that he is the light of men. Okay? It, again, when God created mankind, what did he create mankind? He created mankind in the image, in his own image. So that man could always see God, okay, in the way he was made, or the image of God in the way he's made. That's why all life has value. That's why all life has value, because we're created in the image of God, okay? And, and so this idea is that, that we're made in God's image. In fact, it's the only creation that God claims and declares is very good, is when he creates man. So it's, it's this light that reflects God, right? But then sin comes. And this concept that John uses in, in his gospel he uses a lot of these contrasts that we talked about last message. And one is between light and darkness. So if light kind of create, is, is this vi vision of the perfection of God, darkness is sin and evil, right? And um, so just as light brings life, Darkness brings death. So Jesus then, from that darkness, will bring spiritual life, or the light again. So the light here is that connection with God himself, and God has put that into mankind when he created man. This is why it says that the light shines in the darkness and it can't overcome it. All right, at the end of, at, at the, in verse 5, you know, the light shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot overcome it. Do you know that? Darkness can't overcome light, but light always overcomes darkness. You know, if you have a candle in a room, and you light the candle, and you turn off the lights in the room, it's not going to get pitch black. Why? Because it's light. But if you're in a dark room that's pitch black, and you light a candle, it's no longer dark. And this is what he's saying. This is how Jesus is. Jesus says this light, it, it overcomes the darkness, all right, so that it can't eclipse this light, okay? So again, you know, this theme of, of, of perfection and sin or light and darkness, sin cannot eclipse God's nature in us so that God can still be seen and God can always be seen. Through us. This is why Paul in Romans says this, for, for God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that we are without excuse. God places this knowledge of himself in all of us, which is why people that are running from God or in sin are desperately trying to squash any knowledge of God or any mention of God. Did you ever wonder that? You know, we have some of these lifestyles that are sin, and, and yet they spend all their time attacking God or attacking Christianity, 
And sometimes you just want to say, just live your life. If you really want to live in this sin, stop trying to attack this and just live your life. They can't. Why? Because as long as God is there, they can't enjoy it. They know something's wrong. Internally, God has wired that into all of us so that there's something wrong, and we're going to try to squash him, but we're never going to be able to. And this is a, a, about God's existence, right? He, 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 and, and, and what existence is, right? That God is a source of existence. What kind of existence then? Creation itself, right? Um, light or good. God is the source of good that exists. God is the source of truth that exists. And this is that idea, the darkness can't overcome it. No matter how much we might not like something that's true, we can't change the fact that it's true. And so much we see this in our world today, don't we? We see it in our world today with all this gender garbage going on. And people are just saying, well, but, but, but I don't like that. I don't like what, and, and, and so I'm going to say something different. And because I truly believe it, it makes it true. No, it doesn't make it true. It can't. Why? Because of biology. Because it's the way God created it. It's the way it came from the source. And you can't get past that because that's a fact. It's truth. And God's truth can't be made false. The darkness can't overcome the light. So God is the source of truth. And that's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and it can't overcome it. So sin can't totally eclipse God's nature, can't eclipse God's truth, because what is true is true. I just heard last week there, the, there was a press, the White House press conference or something. They didn't like something some TV host said about the January 6th videos, and he showed the videos, and, 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 and the, 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 the White House correspondent just says, hey, don't believe the facts that this guy is sharing. Don't believe the facts that this guy is sharing. You see, by using the word facts, well, they're facts. You, it doesn't matter if you believe them or not, they're facts. You know, and in this situation, you don't know, but, but, but I wouldn't use that term, facts. But a lot of times, that's how we approach sometimes with sin and God's truth, and we don't like what God says, so we say, well, I'm just not going to believe it. Well, that doesn't make it all of a sudden untrue now. And you're going to be miserable because you're going against that. So that creation, light, or what that which is good, truth, life itself exists by Jesus. He is the source of it all. So this is what Jesus is, this is what John is saying, that Jesus is the source of all existence, all has been created, finds its source in him, and it is good. He's the source of life, and what is good, and what is true. No amount of evil can change or overshadow that. That's the first thing Jesus, uh, John says. This is who Jesus is. He is the source of existence. Can't change that. Then John introduces someone that helps prepare the way for this source or this light that he refers to him as. Look at verse 6. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Okay, now the, the, this is not the gospel writing saying this is me. Okay, this is not John, the gospel writer, the disciple who we talked about, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. This John is someone else. He's referring to John the Baptist. And most of us have heard of John the Baptist and, and, and who he is, right? This is, this is this other guy, John the Baptist. This John the Baptist is actually a relative of Jesus. His mother was named Elizabeth, who was a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So he's like a cousin of Jesus. And he was miraculously conceived. And when he, um, before he was even born, God tells Elizabeth, his mother, who he was going to be. In Luke chapter 1, Luke talks about it. He says, and he, and he, this John, will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So here's who John the Baptist is. He is 
He is someone who that would come and prepare the way for Jesus. We see here a few important details of what this preparation looks like or, or, or details about this John. In verse, in verse 7, it says, right, he came as a witness. First of all, he was sent by God, right? There was a man sent from God, so he was given a purpose by God. God gave him, put him on a mission, right? He was sent by God, and he was to bear witness about the light, right? He came to witness, to bear witness about the light, so that all might believe through him through the light, through Jesus, through this word. So he was sent by God on a mission to bear witness or to point to Jesus so that all could believe in him. And John notes that this guy, John the Baptist, he isn't the light. Verse 8, he is not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. He came to bear witness. He's not the light. He's not to be the focus. John the Baptist did not come for people to look at him and say, isn't John the Baptist great? His purpose was to point to Jesus and make Jesus the focus. And through this, we discover uh, discover something else about who Jesus is here as the source. This word, Jesus, he's not only the source of existence, but he's also the source of witness. And why is this important? Well, from Jesus comes what people see of him in others. You see, John the Baptist isn't the only one called or sent to be a witness for Jesus. Do you know that? All who have experienced Jesus themselves, all who have found spiritual life in him, bear witness of who he is. So basically, someone who has come to new life in Jesus... Their life, their changed life, reflects Jesus to their world. And that witness comes from Jesus because it's as a result of him. You see, a changed life is a result of Jesus. Us reflecting Jesus is a result of him. As we find here, so if, if I've been changed by Jesus, I've come and found spiritual life, I believed in him and received him and, and have life in him, right? Our witness through our changed life is not us that we present. You see, our witness, our reflection, our job as a witness isn't to say, look how nice of a person I have become. Aren't I great? See, this is where sometimes we get off track and we say, well, this is my witness. I need to show my perfection. I need to show how good I am, how righteous I am, and look, aren't I something? That's not a witness. You know what a witness is? Is saying, I am nothing, but I am some, be, been made something because of him. You see, Jesus is the sun, we are a moon. The moon has no light in and of itself. You know that a lot of times we say, look at the moon shining bright tonight. The moon doesn't shine. You know what the moon does? It reflects. It reflects the light of the sun. That's what we are. So when we see the moon, we shouldn't say, wow, isn't the moon cool? We say, isn't the sun amazing that it lights up the moon so that we can see at night? Wow. And that is the source of that difference, right? So when we shine in our world, right? When, when, when we're the light of, uh, on a hill, set up on a hill so people can see, it's not us, but it's Jesus. Our witness is him. It's not us. And that's what John's getting at here with presenting John the Baptist, is, is that without Jesus as our source, we have little to offer our world except our own good works and our own wisdom. And while that's nice, it has no power. It's just saying, wow, aren't I kind of nice? Aren't I a good person? And a lot of times people say, well, that's what I want to be. No. Yet when we present him and his work in us, and we say this is Jesus, we offer our world not us. We offer our world not niceties or good vibes. We offer our world him. This isn't about me, so no one can boast. It's not about us boasting and saying, look at me. It's about Jesus saying, Jesus is so great, you can experience that too. I had no business being different. 
but it's about Jesus. Jesus is the source of our witness. Just as John, John found his witness, not in himself, he wasn't to bear witness to himself, but to him, to the light, and to point to that. So Jesus is a source of witness for John the Baptist and all who've been given spiritual life in him. It's pretty big, isn't it? To realize that, that when we, we're a witness, we're to reflect Jesus. That's why our life needs to be about him, not ourselves. And that's why we, we can make every aspect of our life about him. And when we work, we make it worship of him because he's given us the ability to do all of that. We're nothing without him. And that's what we point to. So Jesus is the source of our witness. And because he's our life, uh, this witness is because of the life that Jesus changes. It points to another description of John that John includes of Jesus in our passage this morning. This Jesus, the word, is not just the source of existence and the source of witness, but he is the source of redemption. Jesus is the source of redemption, of making what was once dead alive, which was once evil and dirty and filthy now clean, which was once unacceptable to God and separated from God, now all of a sudden worthy and accepted by God. This is what Jesus did. Redemption. He is the source of redemption. Look at verse 9. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Okay, so he says, Jesus is the true light. Again, he's not a, a, a reflection. He's not less than. He's not just a light. He's the true light. He's not a distortion. He's the only truth. And this light, in, it, it enlightens everyone, meaning that the truth of Jesus, it exposes. That's what it's talking about when it enlightens everyone. It exposes everyone for who they truly are. For those who are not trusting him, it exposes our sin, that we don't measure up to God. Again, that's why people don't want to admit there's a God, because if they admit there's a God, then they have to look at their life and say, does my life measure up? No, then something needs to change. I need to deal with it, right? But if we've received Jesus, then when the light comes in and exposes us, it shows that we are in the light, and we are his. So it exposes all that is dark and evil, and it shows, it, shows us as we truly are, or shows the, the, the darkness for what it truly is. And again, all people have this sense of God that something that, that is wrong when we are apart from God. And Jesus comes into the world to reveal the world and reveal himself to the world. That's why Jesus upset so many people. Because he revealed it. To those that knew they were nothing, it was joyous. And it was like, wow, we finally have hope. But to those that were posing and on their own merits and not on him, when Jesus came and exposed that, they weren't real happy about it. And we're going to see that in the rest of John, how he has this tension between him and the, and the religious elite and, and, and how people turn on him. Why? Because he exposes it. Because he is the true light. And Jesus comes into the world to reveal the world and himself to the world. And, and that's why next week when we look at uh, verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus comes into this world. And John actually gets a little ironic in the next verse when he mentions this because he says, This is the very world that Jesus created. Right? It was made through him. It bears his stamp. Yet, so he comes into this world that he made, yet the world did not know him. It's like undercover boss. I mean, he comes into the world that he made, and he made perfectly, and he did it all, and he comes into the world, and the world's just like, this is hard, this is nothing, this is horrible, this, wow, there's no God, and, and he's like, but I'm right here, Right? The world didn't know him or the world didn't believe in him, that he was God, that he made it all. And the world he's talking about here is, is kind of the, the world that he created, but also the world now that is lost in darkness. And this is how bad sin has become. It has distorted and blinded creation to the truth. 
right? It's, it's this rejection of God where we can't even see God anymore. And we're like, there's nothing, you know? And, and that's why we come up with all different things of, of creation. And we don't want to attribute it to God anymore. We want to say, man has ability over all of this. And we can change it all. No. And John tells us the source of this rejection. In fact, in chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to... Uh, one of the religious elite, Nicodemus. And he says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. You want to know why Jesus came in and they didn't know him? Because the world was so lost in sin and continues to be lost in sin that many do not recognize Jesus because we love the darkness more than the light. We're more comfortable with it. We're more comfortable. We say, well, I'm in control of this, and I want to live my own life and have independence and do all this, and if Jesus, I don't want, and that's how lost it is. And we see that in our world today, right? That, that, that the idea of God's truth is foreign to so many. And the reality of creation, and, and, God, and they're just like, no, and, and, and it almost becomes laughable because we've taken that and, and chipped away at it so much that it just becomes, well, it's whatever you want it to be, and it's however you see it. And there's no more this, this objective truth in this what God created is perfect and good, right? And that's how far from creation we have gotten. And that's why he comes into the darkness, because all is lost. And not only this, John goes on to say that he came to his own. Okay, who is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the Jews, right? God's holy nation, who is God's possession. God has made Israel the Jews, to be his possession. So Jesus came to his own, who he has made his own possession. And then he says his own people didn't receive him. So now he's talking, Jesus himself came, and he became as a man, as a Jew. We're going to talk about that next week. So he came as one of his own people, and they didn't receive him. The Jews of all people should have gotten him. They, had, they were given all the signs, all the promises over the years of this coming Messiah, and they still miss him. You know why they miss Jesus? Because they're lost in sin, right? But also because they're blinded. They're looking for something different than who Jesus really is. Have you ever been there? You see, the Jews, they were looking for a conqueror, a warrior to go and deliver them from all of their troubles and deliver them from the Romans and what they could see. So when Jesus comes, they're like, they can't be him. He's not the one. He's not the source of this. And they miss him because they seek something that he's not. And they don't realize that he's so much more than they think he could possibly be. And he's just what they need, but not what they're looking for. And isn't that the way sometimes we approach Jesus and why we don't want to trust him because we're afraid he's not what we're looking for? Sometimes people want to come to Jesus and they say, well, I come to Jesus because I want Jesus to, to make sure I'm never sick again or that I am prosperous in everything I do or that whatever I ask for, I can get, that he's my genie lamp. And if he's not that, then I don't want him. And we miss him. And we miss the fact that Jesus does for us what we could never do for ourselves in that he gives us redemption. He takes us from the dark to the light, from death to life. There's nothing without that. No amount of money can get that. Jesus is giving us more than we could ever hope, but yet we're looking for less. And we don't want him. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, so even his own people, people that should have known better, they don't do it. However, it's not all bad. Because he goes on to say, all do not miss him, right? He says, because for those who do receive him, as opposed to those that don't, even his own people, to all who believe on his name. So he's talking about what it means to receive Jesus. We believe on his name. And again, this idea of belief we talked about two weeks ago, it's more than just knowing something in our head. It's placing all of who we are on him. All our eggs in the basket of him, saying I'm trusting fully in him alone. Okay? So it, we believe on his name, of who he is, right? His name. God in the flesh. God himself. The source. 
okay? And, and, and so we believe on the name. He gives them something. And look what he says in the next verse. He gives them the right to become children of God. Isn't that cool? He gives them the right. You know what a right is? It can't change. It's like a law. It's like it has to happen. It's like it is written down in ink, not pencil. He has made us a child of God. When we receive him, we are made, we are brought into God's family by birth. We're born into his family. How? It's a spiritual birth, right? And, and he says, this birth or this, this becoming a child of God, it's not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God. So think about this. When we're born, the, the, a baby doesn't do anything to be born, does a baby? All the work of being born, a baby just enjoys the ride, right? I mean, that's what a baby does. They don't do anything to earn it or deserve it or to accomplish it. It's something that's done for it. And this is what John is saying. Just as that birth, we are born into God's family the same way. So it's not of blood. And what he's saying in that is, is, is it's, and, and he does this so, so in Ephesians, Paul talks about it, you know, it's, it's, it's so none of us can boast. It's not our work. It's his work. He accomplishes it. He's the source of it. But, but it's not born of blood, right? What he's talking about is your lineage. You know, sitting there and saying, well, I'm a Jew. I'm God's holy chosen person, so I have to be. No, that's not how, you're, how we're born into redemption or born to be a child of God. It doesn't matter where you're from or who you are. It's not determined. Gentiles have access to this. This is why John is putting this in here, right? He's saying Gentiles even have access to this. And then he says, it's not of the will of the flesh. You know, he's talking about that. We're not born again. We don't, have a, don't get redemption by figuring it out, by having all of our questions answered, by logically looking at it all and saying, I've got this. And we, we don't have it by saying, I can be good enough. Now I can do this. It's not our will, it's not our discipline, it's not our effort that does this. It's not a, the will of the flesh in our ability, earning, earning it. And it's not of the will of man. No person or organization or institution has the ability to put us there. No church can put us there. Not being born into a Christian family. How, much, how many times have we said, I was raised in a Christian family. It doesn't put us anywhere. Being in the right church, it doesn't. It's an individual thing that happens, right? And he says, so it's not, it's, it's, it's not the will of man that puts us there. No church or family. This birth is of God alone. It's his work. He is the source of it. Now, it's interesting because when we start looking at this, it kind of strikes a balance here between kind of human responsibility, our, our responsibility, because we must receive him by believing in his name. But here, he goes to great lengths by saying, but it's nothing that we do, it's God's work. And that's the God's sovereignty, right? We're born not of human decision, but of God, in that we can't believe, believe unless God gives us that belief. And we start to ask questions about it. I don't know about you, but you start to ask questions. Well, then what, what, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do we believe and then God gives us redemption? Or does God redeem us and then make us believe or give us belief so that we can receive that? Which is it? And a lot of times we, we try to wrap our heads around this, and we're trying to wrap our heads around the wrong question. We're trying to wrap our heads around a chronological order of things happening, and we miss it. Because God doesn't always work in a chronological order. Remember, God's eternity. God works inside time and space. But God is the beginning, so he created time and space. So he also works outside of time and space. So this decision for us to receive God and God giving us the belief is a simultaneous act that happens that is mysterious. It's kind of like us saying, well, no, I choose God. Well, no, we choose God, but God chooses us. It's kind of like when we see a door, and it's the door of salvation. And over the door, it says, you know, um, you know, 
believe and enter. Enter into salvation. And we, we, we walk into salvation and, and we open the door and we close the door behind us and we look at the door and there's a sign over that door and said, you've only come because of me. <laughs> you know? And you get that and you're just like, well, how does that work? God chose me, but I chose him. But I didn't know he chose me until I chose him. You see, that's the mystery of this. And there's a balance that works here. And sometimes we try to figure it out. We don't need to figure it out. Here's what we need to figure out. This is God's work. And if we believe in God, then he gave us that. (laughs) And we are redeemed. And this is God's work. He's the source of this redemption. Okay, so it's not a question of this chronologically, but it's basically... Our redemption is not accomplished by us. It doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from Jesus. He is the source of our redemption and salvation. Why is all this important? Because we need to see Jesus as the source because we are not the source. You see, our life comes under him. And this is what John is getting forth right in the beginning of us saying, We need to place ourselves under him because this Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the source. He is the source of everything that exists. He is the source of every change that we see in us for the good, our witness. And he is the source of our redemption, our very redemption. Jesus is the source of it all. That's why when Jesus later on in John, and John quotes Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In other words, Jesus is this source. As the source, he alone determines what is good, what is right, what is worth sharing, and he alone has authority so that we always know where to go to get it and how to live because of him. We don't have to figure it out. We just have to go to him. And that's what he's He's doing here as he opens his gospel and said, this is Jesus, the source. May we come to him and keep plugged into him. Let's pray. 